Greetings and salutations, friends and gamers of all stripes. My name is GM Dave, I am your man behind the screen, and welcome to the very long overdue return to my System Showcase series. As the name suggests, this series exists to showcase tabletop gaming systems outside of the big three of Pathfinder, Call of Cthulhu, or Dungeons & Dragons. Today's episode sees us revisiting the subject of our original three system showcases, the Fast and Deadly Savage Worlds. But before we sink our teeth into the basics of the system, some clarification on the whys of this revisit, especially considering that those original showcases are still the only three that are currently available. Why then would I opt to revisit Savage Worlds first instead of tackling another system? To put it bluntly, it's because those original videos need a revision. Age hasn't been particularly kind to the original three showcases. The structure is too clumsy, they're a little bit too long-winded, and most important of all, there were small but important details that I just plain got wrong in those videos. Details that then required me to rely on commenters in those videos, and then the pinning of those comments in order to correct. I don't want that to stand for any longer than it already has. Three years of that is too long as it is. It is beyond time that I go back, revise these, and make the requisite changes and clarifications so that you know better immediately in my videos how to run and play this game and whether or not it will appeal to you. So with that in mind, do note that I now consider the previous videos to be out of date and will be posting pinned comments and cards on each of them that will lead to this new series. And with that now said and out of the way, let's begin by answering the question, what exactly is Savage Worlds? So. What is Savage Worlds? In simplest terms, Savage Worlds is a universalist system that facilitates, as the designers put it, fast, furious, and fun play. And a universalist system, for those who are not aware, is a system that is designed to be agnostic for both setting and genre. Meaning you can put just about any setting or genre you like into Savage Worlds, and the game is designed to work with it and will provide you the tools needed to play that. But what does this mean in practical terms, and how exactly does Savage Worlds compare to its contemporaries, namely the biggest dog on campus right now, Dungeons & Dragons 5th Edition? To understand this, let's look at what I believe are the three areas in which the majority of Savage Worlds' focus lies. 1. Cinematic combat that is dangerous and snappy, and we'll get more into what makes it cinematic shortly. Two. Freedom of choice, providing a number of options to players and GMs alike to build the types of characters and settings you want. And three, the encouragement of creativity and roleplay baked into the system itself. Now I very deliberately place these three elements in this specific order because I personally believe that it is in this specific order that Savage Worlds focuses on these three elements. So let's go ahead and begin with number one, the focus on fast, furious, and fun play, achieved primarily through its cinematic combat. Savage Worlds makes it clear right out of the gate that it is a system that is express designed to facilitate combat that is both snappy and intense. And I personally think this is primarily thanks to the way dice are utilized in the game. Similarly to D&D, you're still going to use your standard suite of gaming dice, which means you've got your D4s, D6s, D8s, D10s, D12s, and occasionally you'll have the D20s, though this is usually limited to specific pre-made settings. Where the systems begin to differ is the specifics and how they utilize these dice, though. Unlike Dungeons & Dragons, which frequently makes use of multiple rolls that usually involve multiple types of dice, as well as the addition of different modifiers to resolve single combat actions, which are most commonly going to be things like attack rolls, and then multiple damage dice, or saving throws, and then multiple damage dice, Savage World streamlines this process in a number of ways. For example, Players are going to tend to roll fewer dice and fewer types of dice per action, which is going to reduce the amount of math they need to do on the fly. This math is then further going to be reduced by universalizing the majority of the target numbers you're looking for. Generally speaking, and with very few exceptions, the magic number that you are looking to hit is four. 
Damage is also calculated differently in Savage Worlds from D&D and Pathfinder. You don't have the HP pools that those games are so well known for. Instead, characters can accrue up to three wounds, and once three wounds are received, the character dies. Furthermore, in order to better facilitate the idea of cinematic combat, characters are actually divided into two distinct types, both of which directly impact the number of wounds they can receive. First and foremost are the wildcard characters, which include the player characters, major NPCs, be they allies or enemies, and major monsters. These characters can take three wounds before they die. All other enemies are considered to be extras, and these constitute the vast majority of the different fodder you're going to face. Extras only take one wound to die, so you're going to be mowing through a lot more extras than you will wild cards because they literally have 66% less health than you do. And it's this particular distinction that makes Savage Worlds not only good at running things like epic heroic fantasy, but dark gritty fantasy, or really just any kind of dark gritty or even pulp horror based settings. This combination of the wound system with how simple the dice system is does a great deal to make combat move very quickly and very quickly become deadly as well. And bear in mind, all of this is just a very surface glance at this system. Already we can see that there's quite a few major differences in the function of combat between Savage Worlds and D&D just by looking at a few very simple points. But for now, let's put the combat system to the side. After all, we are going to have a video dedicated expressly to that just like we did previously. So for the time being, let's move that aside and move on to the next point the freedom of choice in Savage Worlds. Now, this is the one area, in my opinion, that Savage Worlds differs the most from D&D and many of its contemporaries, because unlike most D20 games, Savage Worlds is an entirely classless system. Players are instead encouraged to build their own characters custom based on the suites of edges and powers available to them. And for those of you who are more familiar with the terminology of D&D, edges and powers are very much along the lines of feats and spells. This offers an incredible amount of freedom for players to try and create exactly the kind of character they want for their game. But that said, as many of the more experienced among us do know well, the feeling of unfettered freedom can also be incredibly daunting. And to help this issue, Savage Worlds also offers a number of starter builds, which they dub archetypes. This will help to give newer players a measure of guidance so they can help start their characters and then possibly build out from there to customize your typical thief or scout or warrior into something a little more unique and fitting for their personal idea of what they want to achieve. Now outside of this where the character creation aspect is concerned, the core rulebook does offer a selection of different races to choose from very much in the same way D&D does, and most of these are going to be your standard sci-fi or fantasy fare. Elves, Saurians, Androids, Humans, Dwarves, etc, etc. However, where games like 5th edition have gone with the option of releasing multiple splat books that add additional races and class options and so on and so forth to the point that it gets kind of ridiculous, Savage Worlds instead opts to also give and encourage GMs to use its suite of tools and guidelines to create their own races specific for the settings they want to play. This means that, much like the archetypes, the presence of these basic races alongside the creation tools are there to give GMs a solid foundation on which they may begin building their own savage settings, helping them to fully customize their world from the ground up. And this all naturally leads to point three, the encouragement of creativity and roleplay within the system itself. And while this is certainly not the most major focus of Savage Worlds, the amount of customization options present can go a long way towards fostering feelings of creativity on their own. However, the lion's share of these choices are little more than generic abilities, especially where the powers are concerned. Powers like Bolt or Boost or Lower Trait don't exactly inspire a whole lot of creativity by themselves, so of course Savage Worlds needs a way to get around this. If you're generalizing your abilities for universal use, how do you add something to it to give it more spice? Savage Worlds does this through the use of trappings. 
Put simply, trappings are simple ways that a player can work with their GM to customize powers to make them their own. How does this work? Well, let's go ahead and take a look at the Bolt power as an example. At its base, Bolt is a ranged attack that fires up to three projectiles, damaging a single target for each projectile that hits. If your character was a mad scientist, you could flavor this ability to come in the form of a lightning gun, for example. The base function of the ability still wouldn't change, but your GM might determine that the gun has a maximum number of charges it can fire per day before it must be recharged. He might also determine that the gun deals lightning damage, meaning that mechanical enemies or enemies wearing metal armor will take additional damage when hit. Alternatively, let's say you decide to play a dark wizard who bends the shadows to his will. The spell may instead impair the vision of those it hits, causing penalties to any actions that require vision, including attacking. But, on the flip side, it may also be more powerful at night or in areas of heavy darkness, dealing additional damage, while dealing greatly reduced damage in areas of bright light or during the day. In both of these examples, the base power of Bolt remains completely unchanged, but with the trappings, players and GMs are able to customize these powers to better fit the style of the individual characters. But trappings, by and large, tend to affect the combat side of things far more than they do the roleplay side. So what then does Savage Worlds offer to help influence roleplay? Well, there is a number of edges that do provide some benefit here, largely in the form of the social edges. It is primarily through the hindrances that PCs must take during character creation that really help to encourage the roleplay aspect. And I've got to say, personally, this is one of my favorite parts of Savage Worlds. Most anyone with any kind of real experience in writing who's even halfway decent is going to tell you that the most interesting characters out there are the ones who have flaws. A perfect character, whether it's in a story or a tabletop RPG, is going to get boring because they can't effectively be challenged. Because of this, Savage Worlds pairs the powerful edges that PCs get at the game's start with hindrances that negatively impact their character. Now many of these are still going to be mechanical in nature, such as characters who take the lame hindrance, for example, having their pace and maximum run speed reduced thanks to a prior injury. But equally many, if not more so, are roleplay based, such as your character being a big mouth or delusional and being unable to avoid voicing these things. The overall majority of hindrances though have both a mechanical and roleplay aspect to them and players are actively encouraged to keep these in mind as are GMs. Good roleplay should be rewarded after all and Savage Worlds provides a mean for this as well through the use of bennies. Bennies are special tokens that can be earned through a number of things such as overcoming difficult encounters, finding clever solutions to problems, and exceptionally portraying your characters. And since bennies can be spent on all sorts of things, such as re-rolling attacks or absorbing damage, it is very worthwhile to invest some effort into playing your character's strengths and flaws. But at this point, you may well be thinking, this is all well and good, but what about actually playing the game? How does it work and what do I need to play? Well, let's go ahead and start digging into that by going over the basics. As with any other tabletop role-playing game, Savage Worlds requires more than just a handful of people with the desire to play. You're also going to need the requisite tools, the two most immediate and obvious being a copy of the rules and at least one set of dice for each player. As mentioned previously, Savage Worlds runs with your standard set of gaming dice, D4, D6, D8, D10, D12, and occasionally d20 if the setting requires it. Each player at the table should have one full set of these dice, though it's recommended that the GM have more in order to speed play up when rolling for multiple enemies or hazards. Apart from dice, you're also going to need a deck of standard playing cards with the jokers left in. In Savage Worlds parlance, this is going to be your action deck, and it is used to both determine and track your initiative during combat. As usual for initiative, the higher the total, the sooner you act, with aces being at the top of the order and the card suits used to break potential ties. However, this doesn't mean that aces are the most powerful cards in the deck. That distinction goes to the two jokers, which give a host of additional benefits that can severely shake up a fight, but we'll get more into this when we actively discuss combat in that future video. 
Now that everyone's got their tools, the next step is going to fall to the GM, selecting a setting for play. As pointed out in the cool rulebook, alongside the tools on offer to help a GM create their own settings, there exists a number of published settings they might choose from. Deadlands, for example, presents a revisionist post-Civil War America left divided after a vengeful shaman opens the doorway to hell and looses the demonic Manitou upon the world, flooding it with horrifying monsters and magic. On the other hand, Necessary Evil presents a world of capes and cowls where a highly coordinated alien invasion has wiped out the world's superheroes, leaving the people to rely on the villains that remain to save them. There are even settings taken from classic pulp fiction such as the Savage Worlds of Solomon Cain, based directly on Robert E. Howard's stories of the righteous puritanical wanderer. Regardless of whether you opt for a published setting or a homebrew, once the setting is chosen, GMs can then place their focus exactly where it needs to be, preparing the challenges the players will face. The players, meanwhile, can focus on gathering the last couple things they'll need, namely their character sheets, which we're going to cover in the next installment of this series. Otherwise, most standard tabletop RPG protocol applies. You'll need minis and rulers if you're using a battle map, or if you're using a digital tabletop, you need to set your tokens and make sure your map settings to measure movement and rages are set to inches. Yes, you heard me correctly, inches. There are no grids here. Savage Worlds measures out its distances in inches similar to Warhammer 40k or similar tabletop war games. However, though it's recommended that battle maps with minis or tokens be used for Savage Worlds, it is absolutely not a necessity and there are suggestions provided in the core book for how to run these games without these elements. And to be clear, this is the method that I prefer to run them in, as I stopped using minis and battle maps a long time ago in favor of Theater of the Mind. As for the basics of play itself, it doesn't get a whole lot simpler than Savage Worlds. Almost every relevant point value a character has is going to be directly tied to a specific die type, ranging from D4 up to D12. This means almost no worries about adding or subtracting specific multipliers and modifiers unless your GM or character sheet expressly tells you to for that role. All you need to do is reference your sheet for the action that you're trying to do, then roll the listed dice alongside a d6 wild die and take whichever of those two numbers is higher. And remember, the target number of four is your goal most of the time, so as long as you at least match that, you're good. And that just about covers it for the basics of Savage Worlds. Naturally, there's going to be some exceptions to the things I've mentioned here, but we will get to those in due time. In the meantime, I hope this video has been informative and inspires you to take a closer look at Savage Worlds. We'll be covering an in-depth look at character creation in our next installment, complete with a step-by-step -step rundown of how to fill out your sheet and put a character together once again using the Deadlands setting as the example. Until that time, friends and gamers, once again, my name is GM Dave. I am your man behind the screen. If you enjoyed the video, please feel free to leave a like and subscribe if you would like to see more. I also recommend opening the description box down below to follow me on my social media presences, in particular Minds.com, as that is currently where I back up the majority of my content. While you're down there, I'd also appreciate it if you took a moment to follow my webtoon link to Phoenix Rising, my monthly fantasy adventure webcomic. If the idea of a classic fantasy adventure with a touch of intrigue and romance and a whole lot of heart appeals to you, then I am certain you're going to find Phoenix Rising enjoyable. And with all of that, now said and done. Once again, friends and gamers, I would like to remind you in the world of tabletop games, you don't want to just sit back and watch, but get in there and game. And maybe do that with a new game while you're at it. Have a good one.